I am the, uh, we uh, have a partnership on the cattle and I'm the summer grazing manager and so um, that we kind of divide the labor a little bit that way. And I, uh, uh, being the summer manager then when we have problems with flies I have to come up with a plan, you know, to do something about it. And we just noticed that um, you need to know, it's hard to know what's going on because you can't go out there at 3.30 one hot afternoon and to say, oh, there's too many flies, shazam. Uh, that's, you know, because your, your animals are, are in trouble basically then. You're losing pounds. You're um, having other, you're, you're building up a, you're asking for pink eye. You have a lot of economic things coming up behind you like a train when there's uh, flies going on. And so you'd think it'd be easy to just know what's going on with horned flies, with pest flies and cattle. It sounds so simple. We all know about the flies. But like, okay, just read this. This is, <laughs> this is just the beginning. This isn't the paper, it's just the introduction. It's not easy to go out and quantify and say, oh, the flies are too bad, oh, the flies are okay. So, you know, how are you, you need to know what your cattle know. They, they know things are bothering them, but they can't tell you what, that Thursday you should do something about it. And so these are our main flies. The stable flies, we don't have that problem in the pasture because that's more of a fly that breeds in filth around buildings or, or manure piles and out in the pasture in South Dakota. That's not an issue. But the face fly and the horn fly are the main economic pests. And they can cost you easily, they can cost you 40 pounds in weaning weight. That's what my vet told me about just the face fly if it spreads pink eye. And the horn flies, they can steal pounds from you every day because they're working your cattle. Your cattle are going to work to get rid of these flies. Now, the horn fly is a lot smaller than this. And you've all seen them if you have cattle. They're not a native pest, but cattle aren't native either. So they got to be with their favorite uh, host. And so we don't have as many natural enemies of them either as you would hope you'd have because they're not native. And they're the little triangular flies that you see on cattle. So a lot of university people over these generations have worked very hard to try and help us figure out when there's too many flies. So we can then make a plan to do something about it. So now this is about, they're talking about one to 200 per head as an economic threshold. Well, I'll tell you, that depends on the price of cattle and the price of your cattle. And so I really don't know if this applies anymore for sure because prices are so much better than they were. So we're not, and I tried to count. I tried to go out and look at the herd and get up an average. Is this my average? Is this my average? Is that my average? It's really, really, really difficult. I don't know how many averages you'd have to take before it was meaningful. You can go out in the herd. One animal will have hardly any flies on it, and some other animal will look like that. So do I really care about the average? Maybe I care about that animal. Maybe that's an important animal, or maybe that's just too much for my program to have, to have even one like that. It's kind of up to you as an operator. So to get a handle on it, since I saw that just counting wasn't the whole story, I kind of started to look at things this way. Now, I don't know if you can read that back there, but I started to consider the behavior of the cattle. Because in a way, that counts big with us, you know? That should be telling us something. Cattle don't lie. <laughs> and, and so if you look up here, there's tail swishing, which I felt was like the first sign that you have some flies. And then head swinging, when the flies are worth, they start throwing their heads back and forth. And if you have cattle, you've always seen that. And then are they stamping? That'll tell you that you have, you might have a stable fly problem because usually the horn flies aren't making them stamp. So you're getting all these messages from the cattle behavior. And do they yard up in the corner? Like this is, 
this is a, if you have cattle, you know, you've seen them do this. They go against the wind and they get in the corner. Are they gaining weight when they're in that corner fighting flies? They're not. They're not utilizing your pasture as well. So maybe that's one of the things that's, that's, that's going to uh, trigger you to take some action or, or make a new plan if they're yarding. I've got wetlands, and mine are wading and swimming across. It, that sounds just fine, but uh, they were wading so much a cow got mired, which cattle can get mired, and she injured herself. We got her out, but she was injured, and she's in my freezer now. So, uh, and then this just milling, we'll call it fighting flies is sort of like the slang term for it, this milling. Well, you know, you don't really want to see that either. Got a few runny eyes? You better, you better write down how many have running eyes and maybe even who they are because when you come back in three days, you might have twice as many. And then you might have twice as many as that. So that, that looking at your cattle, your cattle are kind of giving you clues uh, as to what they're dealing with all day. The runny eyes, you won't even see face flies because they're only on the cattle for a short time during the day. And then they're, then they're off the cattle, so you're not going to be able to count them. So maybe, you know, we have to kind of ask our cattle what's going on, I guess. And so then I started thinking, well, what really makes me happy when I go out there? So if they're not fighting, they should be doing these things. They should be eating nicely during the day, having a good time eating. Calves should be sleeping. They should be split out in their little babysitting groups like they are on the best days. And, and they should be laying down and they should be chewing their cud, just doing what they're supposed to do. And you can get a clue, like when the calves aren't sleeping and they're, they're, they're following mom around to get the benefit of her tail, well, that's a clue that maybe you're losing some pounds on those calves because they're too busy, they're working too hard just to lay out there in the pasture. And so I made myself this form that is going to be about my cattle and my operation and my tolerance for flies. So this horn fly, that's the large economic pest. This, it has this life cycle. It winters in the ground in South Dakota. Then it hatches, goes right to the cattle drives them crazy, and when the cow lays a fresh, defecates, and the fresh pat hits the ground, that female horn fly zooms out, lays eggs on that fresh pat. Well, then the larvae, see, they have a couple of days, and then they grow, then they'll be um, coming out in about a week. And if you're watching your cattle, you'll see that, like, there's just a few flies, and then in a week, oh man, where'd they all come from? Hatching. So then see, this here is what we did in the past, and we put something in the mineral that they ate every day. And, you know, it worked for a couple of years. But just look at this life cycle. What if this doesn't stop them here? Then nothing's, nothing stops them. Now back at the feedlot, we're trying to decide, well, how do we know if the flies are bad at the feedlot? Because there's very few flies at our feedlot. The manure management is good. You move them. Remember that eight-day cycle for horn flies? Well, we never have horn flies at the feedlot because the manure doesn't sit long enough. It gets hauled away. And then there's a slat building over the pit. Well, the fly pressure there is very, very low. So I asked Mark, well, let's, you know, give me some good good records on between the dry bed buildings where we do have a few flies just because that's kind of a normal environment there and and the building up at top. Well, you know, here's two very, very similar groups of cattle and it's very easy, you know, to differ by that much in a super controlled situation. So there again, you can't, you don't see those pounds disappearing, you don't know what happened to them. So the idea of the economic threshold being a trigger, meaning like, oh, they're below the economic threshold, I'm okay. 
maybe not now, maybe not with today's prices, maybe not for your animals, you know? We have to kind of, each operation has to decide. So this is where, this is uh, about 330 acres where I spend most of my summer. And this, these little lines here are our grazing system. And I think that's a great help to us because the cattle do get moved. So when they get moved from here, say all the way here, um, that's half a mile, at least they're that much distance from the manure. And so we're helping break up that life cycle again. When they come out of the manure, they have a long way to go to find a cow. But see this? Okay, I have to remember that what I do, or my average on my animals, is very much influenced by my neighbors. These are all different cattle herds here, all around me. So I'm not an island. I'm not going to be able to just uh, you know, solve my own problems all by myself, because I'm still going to have flies. When the wind blows this way, I'll have flies from here, 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 whichever way the wind blows. And I think that's pretty typical. I mean, that's pretty common for my area. And so I'm not going to take credit for like thinking ahead of this problem. I'm going to admit that this problem came up and uh, knocked me off the railroad tracks because this is what happened for us. We were doing what responsible people do and we were feeding us fly control and that failed. And then that same year, so we have the vet come out, treat this pink eye problem and pour them. Okay, we're gonna solve it. No, didn't solve it. Um, what solved it was the summer, the, the weather in South Dakota froze out some flies. And that'll deceive a person very easily that the weather might have killed off the flies or the natural environment somehow has killed the flies. And you might think it's what you did, but you can't always be sure that what you did actually got rid of those flies for you. So then the next year is like, no more feed through. That's, I realized that was a big mistake. We'll not do that. And I put just a few ear tags on the mineral barrel that we feed out of the holder instead of putting them in every cow and every calf because that's that's an ordeal in itself actually and I have news from lots of people that those don't work that great either and um, and then we did have one time during that summer where or then we sprayed them and we knew we couldn't use permethrin that had already failed so we did what's recommended and we switched to Phosmate, which is organophosphate you can buy in the hardware store. Great, worked. Then you see what happened in 2014. We, we, we got in a bind and we were going to use that Phosmate again and it was just the most spectacular failure that you could, you could ever see. But you had to be paying attention before and after to see that it didn't do any good. And so I, we, we sprayed them this first time in 2014 and I texted Mark and the grant had just started then you know and so Mark and I were kind of getting on the same page and I texted Mark and said Fosmet failed at the pasture he texted me back it failed at the feedlot too just a big just a big flat zero um, so then this other chemical here this isn't the chemical this is the active ingredient and Lily makes it now and I had read about this chemical a couple of years before that it was uh, not as toxic to the non-target insect species. And so I found some of it, but it already wasn't being manufactured anymore. So I found some in a warehouse. It was perfectly legal to use, but there isn't any more, <laughs> you know. And that did work. And, and we and worked in the feedlot and at the pasture, just 98% control. We went out, and instead of hundreds of flies, we had two, one per animal. So, I mean, we still had to use pesticides. We weren't, we don't really wake up in the morning wishing that we could go to the pesticide store, but we didn't want to, we didn't want to kill cattle. I mean, there's a choice there. So. You can see by our, what that cost us, these failures. 
So we all know that there is such a thing as pesticide resistance, and it's well documented that happens in, with cattle at pasture. And pesticides are cheap when they work, terribly expensive when they fail. And that was kind of the saddest part that we, we use the chemical and then it failed and then you just really feel like you, you've just got to fix this somehow. And another chemical is going to have the same troubles. So help wanted. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, what are we going to do? The chemical store is closed. What are we going to do? And we had read about dung beetles, and I just wasn't smart enough to catch on earlier, you know, that. Um, so I started to look for them. Did find some in 2014, you, you know, after the spraying and everything. And, um, oh, actually, fall of 2013, I found some. And it was actually pretty exciting. Like, you just don't expect to turn over some manure and find happy insects in there. But there's a lot of things in manure. Manure's alive. And um, so we thought, well, maybe more of those insects is one of the things we could do for ourselves. We could not feed, uh, because when we fed, oh, this, I'm a little ahead of myself there. So when we fed the fly control and the mineral, and you remember the slide, it breaks up the life cycle of the fly until you get resistant flies and it doesn't. Well, in the meantime, it, also is unhealthy for the larva of these good insects that are living in the manure. So when this life cycle and of this good insect encounters the chemical in the feed through fly control, then this good insect's life cycle is broken. And there isn't a lot of research it doesn't the, you, you can't easily say, oh it killed 30 percent or it killed 20 or killed 90, you have no idea. I'm pretty safe to say nobody has any idea if it happens in your pasture. So this was one of the things we decided that, no, nah, we, sh we should keep those and, and uh, get rid of the things that fail us. So then I went on the net looking for things and I came across some plans for a contraption and my unhappy dog is modeling here. He's like, what are, this isn't right, so maybe do this. But, so if so, pesticides can fail because there's such a thing as resistance. Um, dung beetles are great, but you can't just like go to the store and buy them either and say, oh, now get to work. Like, be great. You could get a five gallon pail and say, fix this. So you can't buy anything, but to keep this train from coming up behind us and hitting us again, found this contraption, invented, invented in, the, I think, the 1930s. And it's called a Bruce box or a walk-through horn fly trap. And the, you can see here, University of Missouri, they built one and they tested it and it worked. 50% control in Missouri lots of fly pressure in Missouri. And that 50% was enough that they didn't have to treat the cattle with anything else for flies. Oh, now we're talking. Because um, there you could see that you're not gonna easily develop resistance to this. And at least it's something else, another arrow in your quiver to keep this fly, to keep the flies from running you over in that train again. Now, this one was really expensive because it's the first one that's been built in South Dakota, or I don't know, it could be the first one built in decades. I can't find anyone else who has one. Um, you can buy a $5,000 one with electricity and a vacuum cleaner for your dairy. Those are actually commercially available. They walk in and the vacuum cleaner sucks the flies off. But this should work for horn flies. So cattle walk in right where my dog is, It'll, it'll have a roof, and it'll have some canvases hanging right here. So that as the cattle walk in and the canvases brush the cattle, the flies are trapped in here. This is screen on screen, so they think they're flying out towards the light. And instead of getting out, there's little slits in the screen 
they should, they're supposed to, and they did in Missouri, crawl into the slits to get to the light, end up trapped between the outer screen and the screen right here. And I would have just thought it was kind of a crazy idea, but they tested it in Missouri and it worked. And they didn't have any, they didn't really have any bias. They probably didn't even expect it to work, but they reported that it was successful. So we built this, this is ours. This belongs to the grant and it's ready to go now in the spring, just needs that roof. But if I put the roof and the canvases on, you couldn't see what, how it was made. And um, it was so exciting for the welder who built the frame. I had to have a welder build the frame and then a carpenter build the boxes. And it was sitting out by the welding shop and he told me I had to come and get it, take it home because too many cattlemen were stopping by asking questions and he couldn't get any work done. <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting to people, people, I mean, regular commercial cattlemen. So I think they're having the same problems that I'm having, that they want to control flies, but you can't just go to the store and buy something to fix it. What and the fly from crawling back out of it? Oh, there's screen on both sides. So after they get in those little slits, they just can't find their way back out. So it'd be like um, if your window pane had two screens and there's a hole on the house side and the flies got in there, it's very hard for them to find their way back out the hole. That's why it had this, see how it's like an accordion? So the accordion folds totally confuse them. So on the way out, they're crawling into the fold and there's a slit there, they get inside. Well on the way, if they're trying to get back the way they came, well, no, they end up in the uh, apex of the fold again, rather than crawling out the tip and getting through. Um, hopefully, over time, they don't get so clever that they figure it out, but I, I kind of don't think they will. I think I have time. Yeah, it's supposed to work. There's little clean-out doors here for, for dumping out the dead flies. Yes? Oh, okay. Because you get 100 cattle, that thing's going to fill up with flies. It's going to be gross. It's going to make great pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the other trap we, um, we built. And this is an interesting one. It was first developed for tsetse flies in Africa. And I'm thinking, that sounds good. You know, flies in Africa. I want to get my flies. They can't be tougher than that. And it's been tried. Right now, this is the only website up today, but before that at nztraps.com, um, there's been quite a few papers done on it. Particularly, this paper was interesting because it was trying these traps in Canada where you, you get a lot of species of flies very similar to what we have here, and they did great trials on it. It catches a lot of different species. So my horn flies, I, maybe I can cover them with that mechanical walkthrough trap. And then my other species, of which there's really quite a few that can be a problem, some of them at least might be attracted to this. And I'll tell you, just while we were setting it up, there is something special about the blue color as reported in the paper, a very particular shade of blue. They tell you which Benjamin Moore paint to buy, actually. That I mean, they just, they landed, they flew to this thing and they covered this and before the frost that came around probably around 11 o'clock at night or whatever, um, we, we caught several hundred flies. It was only up for a few hours. And those were the stable flies at my um, neighbor's sheep lot. And so that was the first thing he and I had come across that would help him with his same uh, insecticide resistant problem there. He's one of those neighbors in that picture where I said cattle, cattle, cattle. Well, he has cattle and sheep and he's adjacent to my pasture. So we're going to cooperate. So I'll attach links for the plans and links to the papers onto my SARS grant report because I've been told that's the easiest way for anyone to find them. So Mike's concern is that the cattle might not care to walk through this. And I'm not worried about it for my herd because I already 
have, they're quite used to me and moving for me in the grazing system. And I can move them into the corral for other treatments we have done. So I've already, I know this can happen because I've already put them through the corral many times. And I can do it myself in 20 minutes with that dog right there. And they're just, they're, they'll walk through that easier than into a chute, I'm sure. So Mike said, how often will I have to be out there to run these cattle through? In Missouri, they set it up, they got the cattle to go through once, and they had it set up between the water and the grazing. The cattle voluntarily went through it, and they even noted that the cattle seemed to understand what it was for, like it felt good, and they would walk through it voluntarily, not for water, just to walk through it. So that's a pretty exciting, if that happens, I'll have a video for you because that would be very, very exciting to have a zero labor way to help cattle with their flies. That is a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. You uh, just that, we, we just, they just got finished in September and so we just did a quick trial of it in September when the fly season was about done. Oh, it's no problem filling this whole sock up with, uh, with flies. We didn't get to count and, you know, see if it was significant for the, but it does, it does attract them and catch them and there's no bait in there. Just the blue color. Yeah, I'm surprised too. <laughs>